God, how long how long do you want with this one? I'm looking ahead to Kel Brook fighting Terence Crawford. Let me just double check the date. It is indeed the 14th, <laughs> the 14th of November, Ozzy. Kel Brook going over to the States to challenge Terence Crawford. T- tell me about this fight. Um, if you'd have told me about this say, seven or eight years ago, obviously Crawford wasn't the name then that he is now. But say Brook was going over to fight for a world title in America, I would have been pumped up. I would have been thinking this is great stuff. But it just feels a bit flat to me. It's like Kel's going over because it's one last road of the dice, one last sort of payday. It doesn't doesn't fit. It doesn't ex- fill me with the excitement that it should. Kel Brook going over to fight Crawford. What do you think? Um. I'm quite intrigued by the fight because I, I I do rate Kel Brook. Yeah. Uh, and he's got ability and he's got talent and, and it'll be interesting to see what he's got left. Um, I mean, look, since, since he boxed Errol Spence, the, the three opponents have been, been shy. Uh, Rob Chenka, Zarafa and DeLuca. Um, absolutely nowhere near, near the level of Terence Crawford. But what Brook has done, he, he's been kind of a, you know, nowhere near at the moment. Since some pictures of him and couple of videos and he looks in decent nick already and he's no mug look he's he's arguably probably the best welterweight in the uk still um at the moment i mean i know it's not you know the deepest of divisions but i, I certainly don't think it'll be a com- it's just going to be interesting to see how he basically you know his his two eye sockets are going to hold up um i think it's certainly one a last roll of the dice uh, there's a reason he's going over there, going abroad, and he's taking that fight. Um, I understand why that's happening, and it's uh, I'm I'm intrigued by it more than anything. Um, I do think it's a fight I'll probably get up for as well. Actually, um, I always look back at Kilbrook's career and think, kind of, it could have been so much more. Look, you, you look back, I think he's won he's won a world title. He's won British titles. I don't think he won the European. I don't know. If, oh, I can't. I'm not sure if he did. Um, he's a multi-millionaire. He's had big fights, but he could have had so much more. Um, he, he's had. It, it's more. It's like personal issues out the ring, you know, in terms of ballooning up in weight, stuff happening to him. Um, not. Tr- I mean, Eddie Hearn revealed in an interview he went went a bit deep on um, Brooke, you know, thinking thinking right, fuck you. You, you want to say I'm not loyal? I'll reveal stuff, and he's saying like he didn't train for the Carson Jones fight. Um, you know, they took the Golovkin fight because basically they didn't think he'd ever make one four seven again. So much for daring to be great, but basically he took the fight because he couldn't keep the weight off. Uh, but it, it's one of them that you look back and yep, yeah, he has achieved a hell of a lot more than what a lot of boxers will ever you know won't even come close to doing. But it sounds odd that you can't help but feel he could have achieved more, particularly coming off the back of that Sean Porter win, which I thought was an excellent win and his career best win by a long way. That was a great performance, and I, I did have him winning that fight. But then you, you, your next three opponents are Joe, Joe, Dan, Frankie, Gavin, and Kevin Bizier. It's like I know two are mandatories, and they're shite mandatories as well, but your voluntary is Frankie Gavin. There was a fight with Diego Chavez thrown in there as well, which fell through because I think Brooke got injured, which again, you know, like you're looking at those sort of opponents and then he jumps into the Golovkin fight and we now know why more than anything. So it's one of them. I'm intrigued by it. Uh, I'm interested to see how it's going to go. I think Crawford will have far too much for him and I think he'll stop him, to be honest. But it'll be interesting to see early on just, just, you know, what sort of Nick Brooks in. Um, he certainly won a lot of rounds against Errol Spence. Um, he, you know, he was in that fight for me. Um, Spence did start to take over, particularly in the second half of the fight, but he was, you know, he wasn't outgunned or outclassed early on. But that was three years ago. And Terence Crawford, for me, is, you know, pound for pound, top three, a quality operator. Um, and I do, I just think it's probably a, a bit little too late for Kelbrook in this sort of opponent. I mean, like you said, Steve Crawford wasn't the name a few years back, but what a fight it would have been for Brook coming off a win against Sean Porter exactly. to fight the likes of Terence Crawford or something like that. Instead, he's coming off fighting fucking Mark DeLuca. I mean, who the fuck is Mark DeLuca? Still, he's boxed Mark DeLuca, and I still don't know who he is. So, he, yeah. Yeah, he lives on the second floor. Yeah. 
it's one of them. I think he's, I think he's good pals with um, Christopher Lovejoy as well. So um, you know that sort of caliber of opponent. So yeah. So anyway, um, th that's my view. Brooke achieved a lot, but it sounds bizarre. But could have achieved a hell of a lot more. Exactly. I mean, well, I suppose looking on the bright side, at least he hasn't got any eye sockets left to break, Andy. Um, uh, you got the training team of Ryan Rhodes, Adam, <laughs> Adam Etches are coming in together instead of Dominic Ingall. It feels like a bit of a money saver. He's been sniping back and forward with Eddie across social media. This is what the point I was making. I agree with Ozzy. It's not because of his talent. It, it's actually because of his talent. I'm, I'm even more frustrated about the whole thing, Andy, that this shot feels more like a shot in the dark rather than it should have been him going over at the peak of his powers, having fulfilled his vast potential. Not really like Billy Joe Saunders a little bit after Lemieux. Him after Porter was like a sort of stop-start. It, 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 it you know it threatened to get going. It never really did. He should be going over challenging Crawford at the peak of his powers now. I'm frustrated with Kel. Well, you know, after he beat Porter on that, his next fight was against a machete. Um, and then obviously he was at the ring until he fought, he fought Jojo. That's true. That's true. <laughs> after he, it, was, it was like four weeks after it. So he didn't re return until like 2015. And look, he, he's definitely underachieved. I wouldn't say he's a wasted talent because obviously, you know, he's been on and won a world title, and obviously in, in America, won the British outright and stuff. So, so he's no a total waste, but he's definitely underachieved and stuff. But, you know, I, I remember at one point his dad would try to say to Frank Warren that he that they wanted the Pacquiao fight when he was ranked w, WBO number one. And then I think he, he left to go and fight. Uh, yeah. He left Eddie. Yeah, he, he went he to did. Eddie. Ah, uh, that's right. And then he fought Love More, Love More Than Do, which was his first fight with Eddie. Uh, and then obviously they tried working way up through the rankings and stuff. But see, but see if you look at the the, the rankings around about that period, and especially when he won the title, he was ranked. I think it was 2015, 2016, he was ranked one with the Ring magazine as the number one melterweight in the world, right? Now, but, but the following year, Floyd and, and, and Manny had fought, so obviously they two were off, obviously off the board. Can fought once that year, fought Algeria, right? Garcia fought uh, Pauly and Lamont Peterson. Thurman faced Guerrero and Colazzo, and uh, Maidana had fought twice uh, against Floyd the previous year. So, you know, Porter beat Broner. Bradley faced Vargas and Rios and stuff, so they See the names that I'm throwing out there that he could have fought. He ended up fighting instead Frankie Gavin, Jojo Dan, and was it Kevin Busy, I think it was. And I was listening, obviously, you can mention that Eddie Heron interview there last night. It's to me, I was reading between the lines. Did Eddie try to kind of make out that he was doing his dinger, i.e., he didn't want to make those fights? That was, I was kind of trying to kind of take off that. Am I reading that wrong? No, I think you're reading it right, Andy, and you mentioned his dad as well. I think his dad has been a bit of a chain around his neck at times. You know, I think he's been sort of chipping. His, I, I, I can't back any of this up, but it sounds yeah. like he's been, it's you know, putting his oar in a little bit here and there. Well, uh, well allegedly, it's meant to be him that it scuppered the candy when it was like on the plate, it was on the table, it was ready to be signed. And apparently it came in and it was something to do with a bit of money and... It's true can, that. It was off, off the deal. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah, so I'm, I'm saying allegedly, but um, because yeah. you kind of didn't want to come back and bite in the arse and stuff. But Eddie was fucking raging at that uh, at that situation. By the way, for what I was told, and you know, it was there to be made. It was there to be signed, and they said no chance. So he fucked about, and as I say, his end went up what, after the uh, the Golovkin fight. No, he could. You could say it's a favour to Eddie and stuff, but one thing with Eddie was contradicting about actually as well is he says, well, if you turn your back on me, you're done. I know for a fact Eddie would 100% take Chris Eubank Jr., right, if he got a chance there. And this was the guy who turned his back on him and didn't stand the con. And, and he, he took back Josh Warren, so he's a bit hypocritical in that. And one thing I did agree with Eddie in that is, as well, I've got other fighters to look after. You've made your money kind of, kind of thing, you know. So I, I, I get that point. Look, Brooke was free and clear. He's no tight to match room. He can go away and do his own thing. The problem has been as he's come back. And again, it's, I think it's a management problem, actually, in that as well. I don't know... I really say I don't know what his dad's like to be honest with you, but you know, apart from like say, you know, the benefit of the weight, there was nothing up from at one fifty four in regards to paydays. He was chasing Khan as late as twenty eighteen. After that, Zarafa fight, who was he was absolutely listless, horrible to watch, and he's still calling Khan. He was begging for the fight then. He was willing to take the rehydration clause as well, right? And he said he was going to come for, uh, for all the big boys and did the fight again for another year. So. He's either just 
talking nonsense. He's there delusional. Or it's just simply about the cash, you know, the most cash for the for the least risk. Um, and the bonus is, you know, I'm interested to see how he's, he's going to make this weight because if he's if he's struggling, um, if this fight goes into the middle half, latter half of the fight, and Crawford f- fancies it, it could end up, you know, is as bad a beating that Crawford uh, gave him, uh, Crawford uh, Spence gave him. Um, so just need be, after this fight, I think he retires regardless, and it's meant to be a nice wee purse he's getting a couple of million. Um, he's got away to Premier Sports, who I mentioned at the weekend and stuff like that. I'm interested to see how they're mm-hmm. going to charge for the fight. Um, I'm not going to be buying it. Nine ninety nine. Nine ninety nine. Oh no! What yeah, are they going to be charging? Yeah. No, yeah, no, you have to buy a monthly subscription or something to get it. I okay. think it's nine, okay. either nineteen ninety nine a month or nine ninety nine a month. Like nah, that. I'll be skipping that. I'll be skipping right. that. But I say, he's, he's, he's a fighter who, as I say, he's, he has a total waste of talent, but he's underachieved. You know, it's just, again, it's just lack of discipline, issues with his weight, having like Dominic Ingle, having to get Dominic Ingle to move him in his house to look after him, just probably stand guard outside his bedroom door and stuff like that, make sure he's not kind of like going back downstairs to the fridge or whatever and that, going out eating choc- chocolate brownies, going out clubbing, going out getting stabbed yeah. and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> just stupid things, man. Right, so that... that to that regard, it's his decision that making. Chocolate brownie, that chocolate brownie, that chocolate brownie talk is the worst powder of all time. Bro. Oh, I know. That's I know. Fucking worst. I still don't understand it, history. mate. Oh, you're gonna get these chocolate brownies. Man. Yeah, I still don't what? know what it means. Is it his right hand? Yeah, I, I think so. I believe it is. I never, yeah. I never, I never I'm hoping it is anyway, Smiddle. <laughs> <laughs> I, t- I, t- I tell you one thing I don't know if you, I don't know if you agree with me but do you, do you reckon you know, obviously when they signed with Eddie it would be 2014 2015 I think it was Joshua turned pro was it 13 14 so did Eddie then start disregarding Brooke a wee bit and kind of like Patton don't need Joshua because he was the bigger star but at the same I think he time, started disregarding everybody Andy didn't yeah, he around suppose, that time yeah. I suppose but then yeah. Brooke, at the same time, is going to shoulder some blame. His management's going to shoulder some blame, and so is Brooke for uh, his, his lack of discipline outside the outside the ring. Um, that says it will probably even even after the Crawford fight, still call out Amir Khan. Amir Khan could be in a coffin next week, and he will still call him out. Is <laughs> it's his dad? His dad is the problem. His dad is the problem. It's because he's greedy. Um, as I say, that that calm fight was all but done. And he, he, they got wind of Khan's purse and his dad, well, his stepdad, dad, whatever you want to call him, um, moved the goalposts about cash and it just, both fight went from pretty much done to absolutely no chance. Um, and, and, and it's right, you've said it right, he spent too long chasing Amir Khan. Opportunities have just drifted by, basically. Opportunities have just drifted by and they were either forced into taking fights or, you know, taking, you know, like that Golovkin fight. Yeah, he may have been big, but if Brooke could have had those opportunities prior, I don't think he would have been, you know, even looking at Golovkin. But I think they felt, look, this is the biggest chance of our, you know, this is the biggest payday we're going to get. So let's take it now and basically see how we can go. Um, As you say, Andy, 2018, even early 2019, Kelbrook Amir Khan still being talked about and I couldn't care if that fight got made for next year I, it just wouldn't interest me whatsoever it'd be two you know two fighters well past the peak um, and I just wouldn't have any interest in it whatsoever uh, it been, just doesn't do it for me anymore it would be interesting actually after Khan's tweets yesterday actually if he'd be happy to make that a fight now oh mate he'll just go to Saudi Arabia again and fight Billy Dibb or someone like that for about four and a half five million quid yeah I suppose so uh... Maybe Innocent Everest or something. Um, talk to me about the Triple G fight, Smido. I'm trying to think back. Obviously, Eubank uh, lost his pen and all that. Kel jumped in, opportunity for a payday, a bit of a free hit. Well, it's a free hitter around his head towards the end of the fight. You know, he could come back down again. I think he wanted to show his balls, maybe. You know, the fact they'd stuck him in after Porter against Bizier, Dan, uh, Gavin. He was maybe getting a bit of stick. This was his opportunity to show what he was made of. But I think it was ill-advised at the time. And definitely, in hindsight, it was an ill-advised move for him, Smido. There's a lot of hindsight about that fight, Steve. Um, the, the he wasn't he wasn't backed into a corner and forced to take that fight. I mean, he was jumping up two weight classes. Um, yeah, Eubank shipped the bed and Kelbrook stepped in. Um, in hindsight, obviously, in hindsight, it's worked out terribly. He's had his he's had half of his face broken, and then he's come back down thirteen pound and had the other half of his face broken against one of the you know pound for pound top five or whatever. It's a hindsight job. 
Um, I had, at the time, and still now, I had absolutely no problem with Kelbrook taking the Golovkin fight. Um, obviously, it was a bit left field, and they wanted the Golovkin, and they had the date, and they had the fighter, and they had the pay-per-view, and Kelbrook stepped in. Um, but this was off the back of a largely frustrating career for Kelbrook, um, and a very frustrating period. Like you say, he'd been in with Sean Porter, the best performance of his life. I actually had Porter winning that, to be fair. And it was a very close majority decision. Um, but yeah, the best, definitely the best win of his life. And fair play to him for, for going out there and doing it. But then to come home to fight Jojo Dan, Frankie Gavin, get stabbed, and then fight Kevin Bizier, that's terrible. And that is at the, that is at the peak of his powers as well. He was 28, 29 at the time. And that run of opponents there is terrible. That's really where he should have come home from America and really kicked on. And there was probably a gap in the market at the time to be a, to be a standalone pay-per-view star. And he was unable to capitalise on that because of mandatories or whatever it may be. So at the time, in in September 2016, I had no problem with him, with him getting, getting in with Golovkin. The Khan fight wasn't near. The other fights obviously weren't there, going on his three previous opponents, and he's jumped in with Golovkin. And I still maintain to this day, yes, he got beat fair and square. He got he got his face absolutely pummeled towards the end. But the first two or three rounds in that fight, Kel Brook gave Gennady Golovkin plenty to think about. Honest, I, I still honestly think that he landed some, he landed a lot more shots. I mean, because I was a Golovkin fanboy at the time, he landed a lot more shots than 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 what we'd seen, you know, for Golovkin up, up to that point. I think Golovkin was on like eighteen and nineteen KOs on the spin um, and, and Brooke went in, in there and gave it a much better fight than we expected for someone jumping up 13 pounds. Um, like I say, wasn't winning the fight, didn't look like winning the fight and got battered in the end. Don't get me wrong. That was but the in seemed to think he was doing well. I thought he was doing, I thought he was doing, he definitely won he was... at least a round, arguably two. Yeah. I thought he was, I thought he was doing well early doors. Um, you know, I think he, he, he was, he, he, he landed an uppercut, and the and the crowd went wild, and Bean went wild on the commentary, etc. And you know, he was doing, he was doing, he was, he was doing, and did um, much better than than what some of us were, were expecting. But yeah, the, at the end of the day, he got his face off broke. Now, after that, he's come. He's, he didn't want to give up his title, and he's and he's come back down. And and you know, I think I even said this as recently as weekend. How often do we see people going up in weight and then coming down? This is two weight divisions and being the same fight. I mean, we can go from I don't know, Roy Jones, Kell Brook. There's been other examples as well. It's 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 very difficult. Um, he had a few months in between fights, possibly eight months, but it, you know, it's still it's still very difficult. Um, Kel, I, I've said this before on the pod. Kell Brook had world world class tendencies and world class talent. Um, through through whatever reason he's been unable to to fully capitalize on that whether that's been unlucky with mandatories unlucky with being stabbed or you know mismanaged we don't we can speculate what goes on behind the scenes but we we really don't know we've been told that he's been struggling to make that he is um he struggles and he's ineffective or not his most effective at welterweight but yet they're still trying to keep keep making welterweight um on the Amir Khan, I mean, he's one of the most uh, Khan for me is one of the most disastrous PR jobs in in British boxing this century. But yet, Kel Brook has managed to find himself on the losing side of a PR battle with Amir Khan. So that that says that says all you need to know, to be honest. In in terms of Kel Brook's behaviour towards that fight and his comments, etc., um, he's embarrassed himself at times. He's chased it for far too long and far too hard. Um, and just in the wrong manner, and to get out PR'd by Amir Khan um, in British boxing, I think he's I think he's some some achievement to be honest. And, and Kel Brook's managed to do that, unfortunately. The thing about his weight, though, Smido, that's that line on his weight has been about as consistent as his reign at the top. I mean, he, he's a one forty seven fighter. Apart from when he can't make it, then he's a one fifty four. But he's going to move up to one sixty and be the strongest he is. Then all of a sudden, he's slimming back down to this skeletal weight of one forty seven. And he's most. I mean, you know, they just tell you whatever they want to do to make whatever fight. Hundred percent, hundred. You're hundred percent right, Steve. And that's why it's difficult who to believe. Um, you know, and then because the evidence is that at 34 years old, and you know, um, I've, I've had and I've had one fight in the last two, in the last two years. He's going in with one of the one of the pound for pound best fighters at, at, the, at apparently a weight that is that is ineffective at. Um, it, I mean, it doesn't make doesn't make great sense, does it? Um, 
I've always had a tendency to like Kelbrook, and I want Kelbrook to, to win this fight. But my initial thought was that it's going to be a, an absolute massacre, and that's that's still that's still my opinion. Now, in the last week or so, we've had um, interviews from from either side of the of the of the debate, if you like, from Fastcar and Kelbrook telling their side of the story. Um, when it at the outset, it looked a cash out job to me in terms of Eddie Earn and Sky aren't involved. And neither is his neither is his long term trainer. Um, uh, what's his face? Uh, F- uh, Flex Wheeler from Sheffield. Um, so, Tom Dingle. so Big yeah, Tom. Big Tom. Sorry. Um, so so yeah. Then so yeah. Get, so the so when it the, was first announced, the fact that Dom Ingle and Eddie Hearn weren't involved that is alarm bells to me, and that that points towards it being a cash out job and it being a massacre because there ain't many um, there ain't many um, killer instinct fighters left in this sport anymore for my liking but Terence Crawford is definitely one of them um and and if he can if he can take Kelbrook Kel out then he's going to do that um but on the flip side of that if Kelbrook is to believe be believed that he's you know he's all in he's going for it um and he's confident he can win then he could he could I'm not saying he will but he could have more of a more of an impact on this fight than what Twitter would have you think, and what the bookmakers would have you think as well, because Kel Brook's seven to one to win this fight, and Terence Crawford's one to twelve. I mean, you know that that in the nook that if that was on a matchroom undercard, we would call that borderline a mismatch. Mm. Like I say, Kel Brook has got has, has got and has had world class tendencies. We've not seen him for for a few years. He's not fought anyone really with a pull since since Errol Spence, which was three and a half years ago. Um, but on the flip side of that, and as has been said on the pod many times by people who know a lot more about it than me, what is Terence Crawford's standout win? Um, particularly, particularly at, at welterweight. Um, you know, he's had, he's, I think he's had four fights at welterweight. I mean, Jeff Horn, Jose Benavides, Amir Khan, and Kavalowskis. I mean, it, it, they're not any stand, you know, standout names or performers at the time that those fights took place. You can say what you want about Khan, but the 2019 version of Khan was never going to beat Crawford. So, you know, I wish I wish Kelbrook all the best and I, I want him to win, but it does stink of a of a cash out job to me. But again, on the flip side, is it um is it of optimum to take a so called cash out job in the middle of a global pandemic where there's no paying crowd? Because Kelbrook if Kelbrook sat on the fence for the rest of this year in April or May next year, as an example, in 2021, Kelbrook's still going to be a name that could get a cash out fight, if you like, from the likes of Crawford or even even across the pond with with other names. So, do you know what I mean? People looking at it as a cash out job, but the cat, I mean, he's going to get paid handsomely. Don't get me wrong. You'll earn more money than any of us will ever earn in any of our lifetimes for this fight. But he could potentially sit on the shelf and earn more next year so is it is it as much of a cash out job as we think as he took the right opportunity at the right time i guess we'll find out on november the 14th but you know echoing the thoughts that others have said very frustrated i mean he's achieved he's achieved a fair bit but very frustrating i really wanted brooke to kick on you know even when the frank days he was wbo so-called number one or number two ranked for ages that never really materialized i mean them them run of opponents. We can say that Jojo Dan and Kevin Bizier are, are terrible mandatories, but we, we know there's ways around mandatories and you can pay them off or you can swerve or you can, you know, unify this, that and the other. That never really happened. And, if and you really say, want to. Yeah, if you, I 100% agree with you, Steve. If the fighter really wants to or if the promoter really wants to, that could have happened. Definitely could have happened. I mean, I was at the show when, when he beat... Um, when he beat Frankie Gavin. I think that was billed as a rule Britannia type bill and um, I think Lee Selby was on there, Ryder, and I think um, uh, uh, the Welsh lad who got um, who got disabled later in his life, Black Blackwell, Blackwell, yeah, um, yeah. There was a decent decent enough card, but that was in the days when they built a pay per view card rather than had a pay per view star in Anthony Joshua and filled it with Josh underneath. But anyway, we're going off topic. But yeah, um, unfulf- unfulfilled potential is the is the conclusion. Yeah, absolutely. We will discuss the Crawford fight in greater depth on a Sunday evening, no doubt. Uh, but if Kavalowskis can lay hands on Crawford, then Kel Brook with the old left jab, right hand, will also be able to, I imagine. Uh, Dave, I've gone on uh, many a time on this, boring people, and I'll do it again now, saying that I think Kel Brook likely would want to be retired from the boxing game, only am it, um, 
Eddie Hearn rather, is dangling the Amir Khan carrot in front of him, trying to get that one last pay-per-view payday if he can. Has Amir Khan, the Amir Khan fight, the potential been a bit of a chain around Kel's neck, do you think, Dave? It certainly has. I think he's been held sort of kidnapped to the Amir Khan fight, hasn't he? And when Eddie signed Amir, everyone thought, well, we've got the fight together, but was that just to get Kyle Brook in the position to think that Eddie can make this fight? You don't know who to blame for that fight now. I mean, there's been so much back and forth. You know, they both made massive amounts of money, but that, that fight would have made them potentially more money in that one single fight than any other fight that they had in their career at the right time. But now, like, like somebody said earlier, who gives a shit now? It's far too late. Far, it's, it's, it's more overcooked than Pacquiao Mayweather was. It's more overcooked than any other fight that I can think of, really, of that potential magnitude back when it should have been made. And maybe Khan was the carrot the whole time. This Crawford fight, it does seem like a cash out. I know we've mentioned no fans, but if you think back when Joe Calzaghe, he, he, he sacked off his promoter at the time and moved forward, and took the Roy Jones and Bernard Queens fight with no promotional company behind him, and that was so he could keep all the all the cash for himself. And it seems obviously Terence Crawford's is in a much better position than Hopkins or Roy Jones was at that time. But he's probably the money man for Brook right now, other than Khan. And Khan and Brook doesn't have that promotional payment to make anymore. It's all a bit strange with what happened with Ingle as well. Apparently, he went out there in Dominic Ingle's gym, but Dominic Ingle wasn't having any input to this fight. So what's that all about? The, the all three used to be so tight. Dominic Ingle, Kell Brook, and Eddie Earn. What's happened since then for it to fall apart so badly? Strange times indeed in boxing. Um, the con Kell Brook fight, Rob, it's another near miss, isn't it? After the Porter fight... Kell Brook's career definitely nosedived. He gave a great of account of himself against Errol Spence, but it's all about the near misses, Rob. You know, fighting in Bramall Lane was mentioned. They were going to bring over Juan Manuel Marquez, Diego Chavez. Nothing ever quite came off. It all seemed to drift by the wayside. And then these odd fights against Golovkin, uh, the Spence fight, as I said, was, was a good opportunity for him. But it just seems to be a lot of near misses for Kell when we could have really nailed down that big opportunity. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Absolutely. Really conscious of that since I get pelters off the listeners, but uh, ah, fuck no, I th- I yeah, fuck the listeners. Uh, I think um, Ke- look, when you look at fighters, they're a commodity sometimes, and I think um, that's never more evident than the case of Kell Brook. I think Kell Brook himself would he take some fights? He probably wouldn't. I think he's being badly advised. The boys have covered that really well, um, but. You know, it's just, I, I think Eddie Hearn, when he can give it a lot, but when he has to take it, sometimes he can become quite bitter, even Ed. Uh, but I think he was actually telling the truth in his breakdown about Brook. He did it in a snidey way or whatever, with a bit of salt on it, but whatever. Like, he, I think he was saying, like, look, it, Brook has had every opportunity to be better. And I think that's, you, you touched on it, frustrating, like, because he was a good fighter. He was one of the guys that was talked about to be the heir to the Mayweather throne at the time. It's so funny the way things pan out, because so was Danny Garcia, and so was Keith Thurman, and none of them really turned out to be the business at 147, so I was listening back to an old pod, as I mentioned there last week, and we were actually covering Spence, Brook, the week before it happened, like, a lot of us had Spence, but a lot of us had Brook too, and, and you know, it was nip and tuck, maybe, you know, the way things turn out, if he hadn't taken the Golovkin fight and he gets Spence a bit earlier, he might have done a bit better, if Golovkin and Eubank had a fought, Golovkin would have ended Eubank, we'd have never seen him again, so it's funny the way things turn out, but you would have never thought it would have turned out this badly, for Brook, um, you know, I think the Amir Khan fight after Spence, that was the only fight he wanted, he wanted just give in the interim, um, it didn't help him at all, it settled the boxing public on him, he didn't help himself going up and down the weight, and the weight is very, is crucial in this fight, I mean, you know, that's one of the reasons that the rehydration clauses are so strict and everything is that fighters drain them weight, they drain so much fluid out of the body that the actual fluid goes from around their brain. And that's when you're talking about serious injuries. I mean, the last fucking person you want to be fighting at 47, if you're killed at the weight, is Terence Crawford, who's a smaller guy who who's grown into 40, into 47, who's strong, who's brutal, who's and who's himself kind of in an old way because as Smith mentioned, his resume is not great, especially at 47, even though he was brilliant that lightweight and, and 140. Um, he hasn't had the opposition through no fault of his own. 
the Iron move has backfired on him spectacularly with Al Heyman being extremely bitter and then buying up all the welterweights and having them fight each other and keeping Spence as his main man. The Spence, is, Spence fight is the one to happen, but if he doesn't do better with Brooke than Spence, and if he doesn't do better, you know, if if uh, if um, Kel Brook does anything in this fight, then people are going to say Terence Crawford's not the real deal at all. So he's in a no, he's in a no win really for himself because if he beats the shit out of Kel Brook, everyone's going to say he's washed. And if Brook does anything, he's not going to look, you know, boxing fights are fickle. They write you off the next day. Like so, tough position for Crawford contractually and with this fight, it's dog shit fight. I, I, Brook went up to 54 for a reason. He couldn't make 47. Now all of a sudden he can make 47. But what the, what is that going to do to him? Inactivity against at the highest level for the last few years. Eddie Hearn has been alluding to in his interview that he doesn't live the life as is evident in some of his out of the ring capers. Um, so, yeah, I think he's achieved a lot in boxing by beating a very good welterweight champion in Sean Porter. You only have to look at Sean Porter's post book performances to see he is a good fighter, even though I fucking can't stand his style. That's but, true. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah, you know, so so he has that on his record. But it's frustration. Some fighters fight their whole career just to win the world title, and once they've done that, that's enough for them. They can retire. But he won the world title and should have kicked on. Like it should have been about legacy for Kell Brook rather than about paydays. And he's chased the money, or the people around him rather have chased the money, and they let him down a fucking uh, cul-de-sac really. Like in his career, because he's not getting the can fight. He could have had it. Uh, he didn't get it. The British boxing public will never get to, to see that grudge match, and that would have been a great, great event, I believe, if it had happened when it was supposed to happen. It would have been brilliant for you know, it was in the height of the kind of sky. Good old days. It would have been. It would have been. A, it would have been a terrific fight. Um, but that's not there now. And to see him cashing out against a killer is sad in a lot of ways. And I hope he comes through with, uh, unscathed and gets out like with his few few million quid. Because um, I have a funny feeling if he does better than Can, he'll still be calling out Can after the fight. Like something in me says that. Like um, that fight's never going to happen. So hopefully he gets through it on uh, without getting fucking any more of his orbital bones uh, smashed up or cheekbones or whatever left of, his, left of his head after Tyrus Crawford is finished with him. I think, I don't know if Tyrus Crawford is a massive, massive puncher at 147, so uh, it, might be, it might be worse in that, in that it's a beatdown over a sustained period, so... Um, look. You seem to have muted yourself, Rob. Was that deliberate? Or accidentalism? <laughs> sorry, no, no, no. <laughs> sorry, sorry, um, um, the fans are spoken. <laughs> no, but I said, like, nobody's thinking about what if Ken Brook goes out and knocks fucking Towns Crawford out? I mean, it's it's so far-fetched, isn't it? Like, nobody's even thinking about Brook being, uh, getting something out of this fight. Like, so, you know, I'll eat my words if he does anything, but I couldn't fucking imagine this is going to be anything other than a fucking one-sided beatdown. Yes, um, on Sean Porter, I actually think uh, this is a discussion for another week, not for tonight. Obviously, he's actually... He's, he's, um, Attitude is refreshing and he's an underappreciated fighter for that reason. Not in the ring, but outside of the ring. So I'm going to give Porter a bit of credit there. You want to make a final point there, Smido? I don't know if you're going to bring Mrs. Smith in there. Like Jean from Connorsborough. Is she disgusted steady, at Dave steady. Allen being on pay-per-view? Steady, steady. Um, <laughs> yeah, firstly, I was just going to say, I personally thought that I would never see Kelbrook in a ring again, to be honest. Um, he's got the dough. I thought he'd lost the motivation. He'd been inactive. So good luck to him against Crawford. Um, I think that um, Eddie did kind of allude to this in his interview yesterday. I got no problem with Kel Brook going it alone in terms of you know trying. To, he's got a big enough name. He doesn't need a promoter. He's got a big enough name and a big enough legacy. If you like, not that he's got a great legacy, but you know the, the fights and his achievements. You saw Hatton, Hatton do it. Kel Zaggy did it. Naz did it. You know, left Pete, left Frank behind. N normally it was Frank, um, but I think Eddie was just pissed in terms of. You know, they went away from Fast Car, which is fine, but then they came back a few weeks later asking for a handout in terms of the TV, etc. Final point, you don't often see Fast Car and uh, Big Frank agreeing. And they both agree and they both say that Kel's dad is difficult slash a nightmare to deal with. I'll leave it at that.